There was a period early in my career as an attending where I was not finding a lot of joy in what I was doing. I wanted to sleep all the time. Some mornings I cry in an exam room across a wall from a patient waiting to see me to start the day and sort of felt like there were, in my mind, only two options. I could go see that patient or I could leave medicine forever. Depression is incredibly common. The common number that you'll see is about 8% of the U.S. population. But if you broaden that diagnosis to say people that are impacted by sad mood, some level of anxiety, the rates can run as high as 20, 25%. The reality is there's a lack of psychiatrists, but a lot of patients don't realize you can actually call your primary care provider with any mental health concerns. Primary care providers really serve as the front lines when it comes to depression. Depression is an illness. People deserve treatment. And so I think it's incredibly important for those of us in primary care to seek out opportunities to learn more and to kind of feel more comfortable. It starts with screening, and then therapy, medicine, therapy and medicine. We know these medicines work well for a large number of our patients. If it's not working, it's important to think about the different options you have. Do we augment with another medication, or do we switch to a different medication? One of the challenges for primary care docs is what if you have a patient that hasn't responded to the first two or possibly even three oral antidepressants? Over the last few decades there has been the development of this group of specialized treatments. Electroconvulsive therapy has been around for many years. It has changed a lot. It works really well for patients who have failed other treatment modalities. The newer forms of treatment are transcranial magnetic stimulation, ketamine, esketamine, and, and now even some of the psychedelic medications like psilocybin. These treatments, like any other treatment, especially stronger treatments, have side effects and risks, so it needs to be balanced out and used appropriately. I've really come to appreciate the fact that the way we deliver care is incredibly important and may have as much, if not more, of an impact on treatment outcome than choosing the specific treatment. Having a clear understanding of the diagnosis, feeling comfortable talking about mental health. How would you say your mood is today? Really is essential for providing them with the help and care that they need. When you use a screening tool, you give someone the chance to self-reflect a little bit. It's about asking the question and asking the question with a validated tool, but also asking the question human being to human being and, and making it clear that it's a safe space. There are patients who present to the office because they're worried. They may not be able to put a finger on it, but they're there because they know something is amiss. And then other times patients, they're there for a wellness visit or a chronic disease follow-up. And through our screening processes, we see that there could be a concern. We engage with the PHQ-2 as a first step. If that is positive, then we administer the PHQ-9, which goes into a little more depth of trying to hone in on the diagnosis of major depressive disorder. To give someone the diagnosis of major depressive disorder, they need to have a total of five symptoms out of a list of nine, one of which must be depressed or sad mood or loss of enjoyment. The other thing to think about is not only that the criteria are met for a disorder, but also that it's really affecting the patient's lives deeply. They can't advance in their job. They're having a lot of absenteeism issues. They're not fulfilling responsibilities in their family. Those would be examples where their functioning is impaired. Let's look for other things that may be contributing. Is this a substance-induced mood disorder? That's why, in part, the criteria have to be more than two weeks to make sure you're not in the window of intoxication or withdrawal of a substance. You know, we have our, quote, general patients, and then there are sort of subgroups and they need special consideration. It's important to realize that a third of postpartum depression starts in the pregnancy. The American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends that you screen in early pregnancy and in late pregnancy for depression as well as postpartum. Sleep is always kind of disrupted, especially in late pregnancy. That can be mistaken for depression. 
but more often people just think, oh, this is normal pregnancy, and they don't realize that their moods are changing. When you can't relax, you can't sleep when the baby sleeps, you can't let it go, that's really a sign that there may be a depression there. Also, it's extremely important to screen for depression in older adults because they are more vulnerable, they may have more medical needs. Medical illness alone is a huge risk factor for depression. With bipolar disorder, it's important to ask about a history of mania. And the way I would tend to ask about that is if they've had a discrete episode of a mood change, such as elevated mood, expansive mood, irritable mood, that's accompanied by things like a lack of sleep or needing very little sleep for days or maybe even weeks, it's important not to necessarily start them on an antidepressant unless there's a mood stabilizer on board of some sort. And I would say that's probably time for a referral to a psychiatrist. All doctors have a teaching role and any good teacher has to know where their learner is. What are they ready to hear? And how do they feel about hearing the word depression? Sometimes there are some misunderstandings or biases that have been attacked. Addressing some of those misconceptions head on, having them understand that this is a medical concern, that this is not just, quote, in their head. That first conversation, you may not make a lot of headway, but I try to have them come back within probably just a few weeks to see me again. I think in many ways, the most important gift we can give to other people, whether it's our patients, a loved one, or a colleague who's suffering is to be able and willing to sit with their suffering, be willing to absorb the distress. And in every one of those encounters, there's a little something sticky that you walk away with that you've taken a teeny bit of the burden from that person. I think perhaps the hardest part for clinicians is managing suicidal ideation. If we shy away from asking difficult questions because we're not sure what we're gonna do with the answer, we may leave a patient at high risk. Think ahead of time. What is a clinical workflow for this? Do I have someone who I can call to, you know, take this person to the emergency room? Like as a clinic, we know what to do if someone's suddenly having crushing chest pain. You know, we have an emergency workflow for that, but this is a different kind of emergency. Sometimes people think, well, I don't want to give them the idea. It's important to know that there is no data that support that talking about suicidal thoughts is going to give someone the idea. This is part of depression and it's important for us to talk about. We need to acknowledge how hard it is to share that information. But also, it is important to understand if these are passive suicidal thoughts, such as if I crossed the street and I got hit by a car, it's not a big deal, versus having active thoughts of suicide in which there's an actual plan and intent. Lean into questions to ask about how long the patient has contemplated suicide and how close have they actually gotten to following through any particular plans that they have. It's also important to remind the patient that you are hopeful that they will not feel this way forever and that there's a way to come on the other side of this. The funny thing about talking about depression is that when I was most depressed and as I was recovering, I never said the word. We don't hesitate to name other things, even other terrible things in medicine. We name cancer and we give, therefore, like a roadmap for patients and for ourselves when we're dealing with those medical issues. The idea that I didn't even name it speaks to me to that power over you. Now I like to think about, like, if you name it, how much power can it have?